talks in a month. So today the topic is on uh, Git hooks. And I'm assuming that most of you are already developers, so you are familiar with Git. Yes. Yes. OK, so we'll be using a lot of Git terminology in today's session. Uh, so this is meant for people already familiar with Git. So Git itself uh, is uh, a tool for version controlling. But it is uh, if you want to collaborate, let's say a team of developers, they want to collaborate on a particular project. Uh, Git alone is not going to do it. You need a central uh, server uh, to do the server side collaboration. So you can host the server yourself or you can use a hosted server provided by third party vendors. So typically people use things like Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub. So these are all third party servers that do the hosting for repositories. So this is uh, the really the basics of uh, using Git and GitHub. And uh, uh, how many of you have used Git hooks? Just uh, if, if you have used it, just say yes. So maybe uh, Rajan has used it. Meganathan? I use long back. Long back. OK, OK. So that's an interesting point. Actually, uh, I have been using Git and GitHub for a number of years, probably more than 10 years. But I never used Git hooks because most of the time I have been a lone developer. Uh, I'm not working in a big team. So the need for uh, consistency and uh, deep collaboration was not there. So I have not used uh, Git hooks uh, for a long time and only recently last two, three weeks only I picked it up and uh, that is what motivated me to do this session. But Git hooks itself is not a new feature of Git. Uh, so I just published this article and if you look at the history of Git, Git was first released by uh, Torvalds in 2005. That means, uh, you know, it's been around for more than 15 years. So it was released in 2005 and even in the first release of Git, that is version 1.000. Uh, hooks have been a, a important feature of Git. So hooks is not something new. It has been an essential feature of Git right from the day Git was created. It's just that many developers probably are not using it and hopefully this session today will, uh, you know, give you the understanding what hooks is and what they are capable of, and probably this will motivate you to use hooks in your own projects. OK, so what are hooks? Very simple. Hooks are basically executable scripts that are triggered when certain events happen in the Git system. So there are so many things that happen in a Git uh, system when developers I think Aravind got dropped off. Yeah. Let's give him a minute. He should join back.
Arvind, you are muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yes. So I Welcome lost back. my internet connection. I don't know how long I was off. Can someone clarify that? Yeah, uh, you are talking about that Gituk was uh, 15 years old. Okay, did you see this yeah. particular image? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, okay. So I was uh, going through this workflow. I was talking about all these different books. Uh, I, I hope uh, you guys caught that. I did not notice that the internet was gone. Can you repeat that? Uh, the screen, which one you have from this yeah. point, you are discussing. Oh, at that point. OK, so I was basically talking about this workflow. And uh, these are so in this you are doing a git add, git commit and then git push at different phases of this workflow. Different hooks are triggered. So pre commit, prepare commit message, commit message. And once the commit is successfully done, then the post commit hook is executed. So that's the commit workflow. Then when you want to push these changes to the remote repository, let's say on GitHub. Then just before pushing is initiated, this particular hook will execute pre push. Right now, all these changes will go to the remote repository. Which is let's assume it is uh, GitHub. Now on the remote repository, there are three more hooks which can execute. That means when the changes are received by GitHub, this particular hook will ex execute pre receive. Once this is through, then the update hook will execute and this hook is special hook. It will execute on every particular branch which is being pushed to the remote repository. OK, so this pre receive hook will execute once for the push, but then update hook will execute for each reference that is being updated. So if you don't understand what is the reference in a simple simpler language, it will execute for each branch th that is going to be pushed to the remote. Finally, when all these are completed, then the post receive hook will execute. OK, so now you can see the uh, at a high level. Uh, hooks are all uh, linked to specific events within the workflow. Plus there are two types of hooks broadly. One is client side hooks which run on the developers mission. So these are all client side hooks that you see here. Pre commit, pre push, post commit, commit message. These are all client side hooks. Then you have server side hooks, which is post receive, update, pre receive. These are all server side hooks which execute on the server. Let's say GitHub. OK. Having said that, there is a uh, limitation. That is to say, <coughs> not everyone allows you to execute server side hooks. Although server side hooks are kind of standardized by Git, most of us are using the free tire of GitHub. If I'm not mistaken, so under the free tire of GitHub, you will not be able to execute any of the server side hooks. You can only execute the client side hooks. So that is one uh, limitation, but then GitHub and other uh, vendors also they have uh, paid uh, uh, subscriptions. For example, uh, GitHub has a enterprise server GitHub enterprise server. So if you have uh, Let's say you install that enterprise server or you are using a third party hosted GitHub enterprise server, then that uh, particular installation will allow you to execute server side hooks. But for most of us who are using github.com under a free tier, we will not be able to use the server side hooks. So what does it mean? Does it mean uh, that it's end of the world? No, it, uh, there are many alternatives to uh, Git hooks. Some of you might have already used some of these alternatives. One is called web hooks. Basically, you have a script somewhere which is accessible, accessible through a public URL. And you can trigger that particular uh, uh, API through the as a web hook. So GitHub and GitLab, all these guys allow you to configure web, web hooks as part of your repositories. So that is one way. An alternative is web hooks. The other alternative is what we spoke about. Uh, I think a month ago I gave a session on GitHub actions. 
So GitHub Actions is uh, enabling developers to automate a lot of stuff on the server side, specifically uh, CI CD pipelines. So it's possible for you to use GitHub Actions to implement these things. But it will be uh, done differently uh, within the world of GitHub Actions. It will not be conforming to the Git specifications as you see them here. So that is one difference, but there are a lot of things you can still automate on the server side using GitHub Actions. So same thing is available on GitLab. GitLab, for example, has a CI CD uh, feature. So you can use that to automate stuff on the server side of things. Furthermore, on GitHub, you can have like uh, integrations with third party apps. So for example, let's say you do a push. And then as a result of the push, you want to uh, give a notification to Slack. So let's say the project team is having a Slack channel, uh, a Slack application, and you want to notify on that channel that a, a new commit has or a new push has happened on this particular repository. So GitHub application integration also allows you to do those kind of automation on the server side. So the reason I'm mentioning these things is just because server side hooks are not possible on GitHub on the free tier doesn't mean that you can't do server side uh, automation. There are other alternatives, as I just mentioned. So client side hooks and server side hooks. These are the two things uh, you know at a high level. At a slightly a slightly different classification is pre hooks and post hooks. So there are hooks which run before an operation, for example, pre commit. There are hooks that run after an operation. That is example is post commit. So this is a broad classification of uh, the type of hooks that execute. So what does it mean? Uh, so to give you a specific example, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to do a commit. Now I have a policy internally in my project team that all commit. Uh, uh, before doing a commit, I should do a uh, check whether, uh, for example, the coding guidelines are being followed. So as part of this pre commit hook, I will include a script which will execute and check uh, the particular files which have been changed. It will check those files whether these changes conform to the coding guidelines. And if they conform to the coding guidelines, this particular hook will return a zero value. So a zero value means that there is no error and the commit operation can continue. So it will continue to the to complete the commit. But let's assume that a particular change that you are trying to commit, it doesn't follow the coding guidelines. Maybe there is an extra space, an extra tab, or you know the naming of the variable is not correct. Whatever be the reason, this hook will catch that. That means you have, as a developer, you have to write the contents of this hook. It will catch that problem and it will return a non-zero value. So a non-zero value indicates to Git that the commit should not proceed. There has been an error and immediately the commit operation will terminate. And the message will also, I mean, obviously in the hook, you can print out the message to the developer. So developer will know what is the reason this particular commit has failed. So pre commits generally return a value, either a zero or a non zero value. Zero means no error. Commit operation can proceed. Uh, a non zero value means that there is an error and the operation will be aborted. Well, so can post, we, can we define what are the errors? Uh, just hold on. I will complete this, then we can pause for questions. So what is post commit? Post commit, unlike pre commit, doesn't return any value or even if it returns, that value is irrelevant. Why? Because the commit of operation has already been completed. So any return value from post uh, hooks, they are not so important. What is important in your script that you have to take care is the return value on of pre uh, hooks, pre type of hooks, including like prepare, commit message, commit message and so on. So with this, we'll pause for questions. Yeah, so what I was asking Arvind is that uh, can we get the different kind of messages? What is the kind of error a developer has made in pre-commit hook? Yeah, yeah, you can get. I will show you a demo shortly. Then we'll uh, understand. OK. Yeah, any other questions?
OK, so if no other questions, we'll uh, proceed. Uh, so we'll proceed with a short demo. So I have here a sample uh, repo. So let me see if I can increase the font size. Maybe 18. Yeah. So I have here a sample repo. Now the first thing is, uh, Before looking at a sample repo, uh, I will uh, we'll look at one of the existing repos. Let's say FTRW or let's say Flask tutorial. Right, this repo already exists. Uh, I have made a clone of it locally, and uh, every uh, 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 clone or uh, whenever you check out or you do a git in it. You know, you will notice that there is a hidden folder. I'm sure most of you are aware of this. So every Git uh, checkout or a clone will have a hidden folder like this. So we are inside such a folder. So we are in the Flask tutorial uh, repository, which has a hidden folder dot Git. But this is only available in the working directory where you have a clone or a checkout. This dot Git folder will not be available on your uh, remote repository, the bare repository like on GitHub, right? So this is only for helping developers to do their work. So now within this hidden folder of uh, .git, you will notice that there is a folder called hooks. Go into this folder, you will see a bunch of hooks already uh, made available to you as a developer. So now all these hooks, uh, uh, they are all having a suffix called .sample. So this dot sample is simply to uh, disable the hook. Otherwise, what will happen, even if you don't want it, these hooks will start executing. So the way these hooks are shipped uh, by default, these are all sample hooks just to help developers to get started, how to write hooks. So these hooks are available by default on any uh, Git repository that uh, you work with. And uh, because they are having a suffix of dot sample, they are by default disabled. So if you want to enable any of these hooks, what you need to do is remove the suffix and make the hook executable. No further configuration is required. So you notice that the names of these hooks are all standardized, right? So you can see here pre-commit, then uh, post-update, pre-receive, pre-push, uh, prepare commit message. So many of these uh, things we have seen in this particular figure. So the same names are there. So what does it mean? There is no specific uh, special configuration required to trigger these hooks. These hooks are triggered by naming convention. So uh, pre-commit hook is triggered exactly when before you start the commit procedure at the point when the commit procedure starts. And pre-push hook is triggered when you invoke the, when you run this git push command. So it is all driven by naming convention rather than through uh, extra configuration files. So now, uh, you know, these hooks don't execute in this particular repo, mainly because they have the suffix dot sample. But this is something I have uh, changed in the sample repo. So if I go to the sample repo and I look at the hooks folder, first of all, let me do this. I look at the hooks folder. Firstly, I will notice that you will notice that hooks is no longer a folder in this particular repo. What I have done is I have uh, made it a soft link pointing to another folder called hooks. So where is this folder? This folder is actually part of the repository. So if I go to this repository, I have here two hooks, pre-commit and pre-receive. And what I've done is from dot git, I have created a soft link to the hooks folder, which is now part of the repo. 
Now, some of you may be able to guess why am I doing this? Can you guess? Why is it I am doing it this way? Why not store these hooks inside dot git hooks folder? Why do I create a soft link and move this folder under the main git folder? Main uh, repository folder. You want to check them in and correct. Correct. So that is the answer. So the thing is inside git you cannot create a folder called dot git and uh, subfolder called hooks and commit into your repository. You cannot commit like that because dot hit git is a special folder which cannot be committed. So the only way only one of the workaround for this is you create a hooks folder committed part of your repo and then when you check out you can create a soft link from dot git hooks into your hooks folder. So this is one way to do it. There is fortunately another way to do it, which some of you may prefer. There is a configuration variable which will help you to achieve the same thing. So you know that Git has so many configuration variables. So there is one variable called core hook path, hooks path, as you can see here. So there is a variable called core dot hooks path. So in this variable, you can configure and you know, so for example, in our example, the way I would do it is like this. So let's say I take a new file. The way I would do it is since our folder is hooks, I will run this command. Because hooks is now part of our, if you see here, this is our sample project. So hooks is a top level folder in a, in this particular repository. And this I am configuring it in the hooks path or dot hooks path hooks. So if I do this particular configuration, I don't need to bother with creating a soft link. From uh, you know dot git hooks to this particular folder. So instead of a soft link, I can do the same thing using this particular configuration command. Now there is still a problem here. I mean, this is perfectly fine. This is all you need if all the developers in a particular team want to share hooks on a particular repository. But what if you want to share hooks across repositories? So then the solution would be to commit all these hooks in a separate repository. Check out that particular repository in your local system and then configure this path globally. Now, if you do this global configuration, any project on any project or repository that you do uh, Git operations, the hooks, the hooks at this particular path will get triggered. So I hope you are following. So you have a choice as a developer or as a project manager to do these things either at the repository level or globally across all repositories, uh, you know, in which you want to make use of hooks. OK, so uh, we'll pause for questions shortly, but before that I want to show you something simple. So we have the sample repository. Let's do a git status. As you can see here, I have two files. Which are uh, like modified. So how do I commit? So let's say I can do add first. So I've done add. Nothing has happened because there's no particular hook for git add. Now I want to do a commit. So I added the two files. I'm doing a commit. So what has happened? Uh, OK, actually, I'm not supposed to have done it this way. Yeah, it is not yet committed. Actually, I should be running it here. The reason is uh, let's look at the commit here. The reason is I've created a. Commit a pre commit hook and this hook is not a shell script. The way I have written it. I have written it as a Python script and you can control what language you want. So typically the common languages used for writing hooks are uh, bash script or it can be a Perl script. So these traditionally these have been the main languages, but then a lot of people are using uh, Python and Ruby scripts as well. So I personally I use Python scripts for all the hooks. So that is why this hook is set up as a Python hook. So it did not execute here properly because here I don't have a Python executable in this particular terminal, git bash. 
but I have it here. So here I have, uh, you know, created a Python virtual environment and I'm running Python 3.7.7. So here I do the same operation, git commit. I do a git status. You can see the uh, files have been staged. So I do a git commit and give some commit message. Now you see uh, I got a output and the same output. This is what I'm getting from my. Uh, what do you call my pre commit hook? So earlier somebody in the group asked a question, you know, can I control the messages that I want to print and can the developer see these messages? Yes. So in, in my case, you know, this is a Python script, so I'm doing a print. But if it's a shell script bash script, you would do an echo and stuff like that. And why is it that this comment commit failed? See, if I do a git status, the files have not been committed. They are still in the staging area. The reason for that is I am returning a non zero value. So this non zero value basically indicates that you know there is a problem and the commit should not proceed. Whereas if I re receive uh, return a zero value, it would mean that this hook ran successfully. There is no problem with this commit and the commit can proceed. So if I run the same command commit again. Now you see the commit actually happened. Two files change, two insertions, two deletions, and if I do a status, you can see the uh, working tree is clean, nothing to commit. So the way to control, you know, uh, whether the commit should proceed or not, is based on the return values. Any questions at this point? Okay, if no questions. Uh, so this can be a very good tool to debug a particular program. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, use cases. So since you mentioned that, what are the use cases? Uh, so you mentioned debugging, uh, but typically people uh, tend to use it for unit testing. Let's say before doing a commit, locally you want to do a basic unit test. Okay. So uh, that unit test can be triggered here, for example. So uh, so that is one particular example. And if the unit test fails, you will return a non-zero value. If the unit test succeeds, you will return a zero value. So then the commit can continue. But so uh, is it trying to replace CI/CD role here? No, actually, I gave this only as an example because. People in the documentation, those who write the documentation, they give this as some of the examples, unit testing, etc., etc. But personally, from my experience, this is not the right place for unit testing. And I'll tell you why, because unit testing is not something that happens in seconds or milliseconds. Unit testing will take a few minutes, at least at the minimum. And uh, git commit is a very frequent operation that developers use. So we don't want to uh, reduce uh, developer productivity by including extra things in the workflow. So the real use cases, in my opinion, uh, I will show you the use cases, uh, real use cases. So for pre-commit, one of them is, for example, checking the st coding guidelines. That is one uh, common example, which shouldn't take too much time, unlike unit testing. Then other examples is, for example, uh, sometimes people by mistake, they commit uh, secrets in the commit. What do I mean by secrets? Passwords, AWS uh, credentials or private keys. So these are things which a pre-commit hook can catch. So here you can write some logic to say that, OK, you are trying to uh, commit a AWS credential or a private key as part of the commit. And immediately it will abort. Are you following me? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So in Devopedia, how are we using it? So I'll give you a specific example. In Devopedia, we use uh, uh, CSS, obviously, but we also use uh, less. You know, less is a style sheet uh, like a language. So you compile less files into CSS files. Some of you may be using uh, instead of less, you may be using SAS, that is SASS files. So you compile them into CSS files before uh, deploying it. So what happens? Let's say in your project you have modified the less files, but you did not regenerate the CSS files. 
So a pre-commit hook can catch that. And that is exactly what we are doing in Devopedia. Suppose I have touched, modified the list files, but I forgot to regenerate the CSS files. Then this particular hook can catch, saying that uh, you know you have changed list files. You need to regenerate the CSS files. So that is one example where we are using this. Another example is uh, we use GitHub Actions for automation on the server side. So GitHub Actions require so some of our actions uh, are dependent on certain secrets. And those secrets uh, need to be checked in, uh, but they uh, should not be checked in in plain text. So they will be encrypted and then using PGP and then committed. So we have a hook which will uh, tell the developer that some of the secrets have changed. You need to regenerate uh, the zip file and then encrypt it into using uh, PGP and then commit them. So those kind of warnings are also in place when we do this. Many more use cases are there, which are documented here. I'll just show you briefly some of the use cases. Uh, so take for example, let's say you are committing some JSON files. So there is a particular hook which, which will check whether the JSON is formatted properly or the YAML is formatted pro properly. Or fixing problems, for example, you know, fixing the byte order marker. So it's a text file, but then the you know you have a little Indian and big Indian encoding. So this byte order marker sometimes causes problems. So there is a hook to fix that. Sometimes you don't want trailing white spaces when you commit. So this hook will catch that. Protecting secrets, which we have already talked about, detecting private keys, detecting AWS credentials, enforcing certain policies. For example, you don't want people to commit to a certain branch or you know only some authorized people are supposed to commit to a certain branch or forbid new sub modules so all these can be all these are hooks which you can use in your system any questions at this point so these are the many use cases actually so the this other use case for example uh, i just want to conclude post receipt so where is post receive running? If you recall, post receive is the last thing that happens on the server side. That means you have done everything, you have pushed your changes, and after doing all this, everything is through. There are no issues. So the remote repository has been updated. Then this post receive is triggered. So now what is the typical use case of for post receive? There are a number of things you can do. For example, you can inform the rest of the team that a new uh, push has been received into the re repository. Or if the team is already on Slack, this post receive hook can trigger Slack notifications. Or send emails. So a lot of things are possible in post receive. Some people even recommend you can directly. So once the push is through, you can immediately deploy the changes to a production server. But in my experience, I would not recommend that because before doing this, typically you want to invoke your CI CD pipeline. And uh, so this is not the right place to push to production. But what you could probably do is uh, start your CI CD pipeline here. And any push that happens to deployment, uh, I mean, updating the deployment can be part of the CI CD pipeline, not part of the post receipt. Any questions? Yeah, Arvind, uh, this uh, these are all Git hooks or GitHub hooks. These are all Git hooks. Uh, these are all defined by Git. But and uh, that way, the server side. That way, GitHub are... actions and uh, uh, Git, uh, Git hooks are same, or uh, it's a different. Thing? Different, yeah. GitHub actions are different. That is specific to GitHub. Whereas uh, but... these are all Git hooks defined by Git. Okay, is the name different or is the purpose is same? No, purpose is also different. See, GitHub Actions uh, are meant for more sophisticated processing. And uh, typically GitHub Action happens after everything is completed. That means it happens after this point. Everything is received and updated. Then the GitHub Actions take over. Typically, and GitHub, we can, we can use hooks also in GitHub hosting? Uh, you can't do it on a free tier. 
you can do it if you deploy your own github enterprise server okay okay fine got it. or if there is a third party service providing or even github giving you that service on enterprise server you can do it but on free tier you can't use any of these things okay got it yeah so in and when did when did this standard come pardon when did this standard come in git oh like i said in the beginning this is actually an essential feature of git git was released in 2005 even the first release of git had hooks oh, okay right so hooks are a not not a new feature but they are not very well known because developers are not using them effectively right okay thank you Okay. Any other questions? So maybe many of them are not using the enterprise version. They must be using the open source Git or. Yeah, yeah. So for those people, you can't make use of the server side hooks. Yes. So yes. then you can do GitHub Actions, but the problem with GitHub Actions is you can't do these things here. So I'll tell you what is the importance of server side hooks, which I did not mention earlier. See, although you know, as a project manager, I I will tell my team, you know, you need to run all these hooks so that we can have consistency the way everyone operates or works within the team. That means to say, all the Git uh, commit messages are following a certain format, coding guidelines are met, and certain developers are prohibited from uh, making changes to certain branches. so all these are nice to have but you see server side hooks uh, sorry client side hooks are uh, in comp uh, developers have complete control of uh, client side hooks so as a project manager i cannot enforce anything so developer can simply disable all these hooks all he has to do is change the configuration uh, or get uh, delete the hooks folder and none of the hooks will execute so the way to enforce uh, you know these standards and uh, best practices is via server side hooks so that is why the enterprise uh, version becomes important because you can implement all these things on the server side however if you have full control on the server that means to say you don't rely on github.com rather you are you in house you are managing your own uh, gitlab server so then you can implement all these things within your server so you can enforce all the policies using server side hooks so now your developers on your team don't have a choice even if they disable these things you know you can enforce the policies using server side hooks so that is the reason why server side hooks are important so uh, any further questions i have a couple of things to cover before that any questions we can cover them now okay if there are no questions two things i want to cover uh, one is that you know we spoke about uh, configuration configuration uh, of this hooks is very simple all you have to do is update the dot git fold uh, hooks folder or even simpler you just configure the core hooks path variable to the folder where your hooks are uh, stored that's all you need to do then the hooks will execute right uh, and uh, you can you have a choice of languages you are not restricted to only bash scripts you can use python or ruby etc uh, etc et but uh, if you are using many of the tools see developers normally work with a uh, host of tools so let's say in a java uh, java project you may be using maven or you may be using gradle which again in android it is very common so in these kind of uh, build tools or tooling there are other ways to set up the hooks simpler ways there is a plugin in Ma maven for example in gradle you can write a dependent script which will set up this path for you right so i mean there is nothing complex here you can easily do it here but uh, this uh, by putting it as part of your build system it may ensures that you know you don't forget to configure the paths so that is the purpose of putting it as part of your build systems 
In Node.js, for example, there is a project called Husky, which will help you to wire up all the hooks in the package.json. In PHP, you can use the composer.json to configure the hooks path. So every uh, you know development environment has something to integrate hooks into their development environment. Then there is one thing uh, much more interesting. There are hooks frameworks which will help you manage hooks. So one of the frameworks which is popular is pre-commit, which is coming from the world of Python. So here all the hooks are implemented as Python scripts. And this pre-commit itself is a repository. So now the beauty of this is there are already hooks which have been written by others for you. You don't have to write these hooks. So you can simply use this repository called pre-commit hooks. And you can uh, simply make use of hooks already available out there. So some of the things which I already talked about, uh, like trailing white space or uh, checking the formatting of JSON files or YAML files, they are all coming from this particular repository. So you don't have to write hooks on your own. Uh, you can make use of hooks which others have written and uh, use them in your project. So if you are using some of these frameworks, uh, they have certain commands like pip install uh, pre-commit, which will help you to install uh, you know, the hooks in your project. So there are ways to do it. Uh, you know, uh, so, but in Devopedia, we are not using those things. Uh, we, uh, the way I do it in Devopedia is to simply configure the configuration variable. This is what we do in Devopedia. And then the hooks automatically execute when, whenever we do any of the Git operations. Okay. So that's one thing. The second thing is we already I already spoke about performance, right? So this is something that happened in February 2022. That means hardly two months, two, three months back. So what happened was that uh, GitHub. Uh, See, I said that GitHub doesn't allow you to write custom server side hooks. That is to say you cannot customize the uh, pre receive, post receive and the update hooks. But although developer can't customize GitHub on its own executes certain hooks, which you might have noticed occasionally. For example, if you try to commit a file which is larger than I think 100 MB or something, GitHub will uh, uh, dis uh, disallow the commit or disallow the push rather. And the way GitHub does this is uh, using these hooks on the server side. So that means uh, in, uh, GitHub is already running server side hooks, but they are all internal to GitHub. As a developer, you cannot control those. Right? But one of the problem which GitHub noticed is their hooks, they take as much as one second to execute. On average, they take 880 milliseconds to execute, which GitHub felt that it is too slow. And one of the reasons for that was all their hooks were implemented in Ruby. In fact, most of GitHub, GitHub backend is implemented in Ruby. So what they did was, and by analysis, they found that most a lot of this time is spent in actually loading the Ruby dependencies. Because every time a developer does a Git push, these uh, hooks will execute in the backend in, on the GitHub server. But to execute the hook, first you have to uh, execute, uh, instantiate the Ruby runtime environment and load all the Ruby dependencies. So that itself takes like uh, half of this time, half of this 880 milliseconds. And after that, to execute the hooks, it takes for more time. So 99% of the pushes, you know, they were like, running uh, close to one second. So then what uh, GitHub did, uh, did recently is that they rewrote all the hooks in Go. That is the first thing they did. Second thing they did is they uh, now run all the hooks as a service. That means the service is already running. All the any dependencies, they are already loaded. And any Git push will immediately trigger a particular, let's say, API of the service. To uh, execute a particular hook. So now the runtime has come down drastically from 880 milliseconds on average to 10 milliseconds. 
so in fact if you are a active user on git using github for your uh, repositories in the last 2 3 months you would have noticed this change now your pushes are actually faster so this uh, optimization has been done by github in february and now it's been pushed uh, uh, made available in the github enterprise server as well so as a last bit of warning to developers when you write hooks don't put uh, too much complex stuff in your hooks because it is immediately going to uh, impact the developer productivity that is why i say things like unit testing triggering uh, production deployments they should be part of ci cd pipelines not part of git hooks because when you run git hooks you want to turn around time of maybe 1 second 2 seconds not in the order of minutes so that's it from me any questions any comments or thoughts so uh, i uh, arvin uh, this is interesting yeah. i was thinking uh, let's say if i want to create a, a code review request as soon yeah. as the push happens yeah and uh, i want to name the code review request with the same uh, name as the commit yeah. message yeah so uh, can i use hooks to yeah but what server Just, are you using where is your repository hosted is mm, it a enterprise yeah. github enterprise server because on a free tier you cannot mm. do it you can't do server side hooks so the solution for you is to use github actions mm. so you can do this via github actions uh, but problem with github action is it has a starting time see the hooks mm. are meant to be very fast in the order of seconds or milliseconds they, they are expected to execute that is the purpose of hooks but when you right. go to github actions uh, the it starts a vm and the actions that you specify let's say in your particular case you want to uh, notify people for a code review so for right. that particular case uh, you can't use this uh, i mean you can use this but uh, yeah, it's fine Uh, you can use github actions only thing is there will be a slight delay mm, it has to launch right. a vm and the github action will uh, run within the vm to trigger the notification for code reviews right right yeah but you have to remember the use case uh, why github actions or any ci cd pipeline was invented and why good git git hooks git hooks uh, are meant to be uh, fast execution and they give mm. you fine control that means within the workflow there are so many touch points so hooks can run at any of these points whereas right. github right. actions execute only here after everything is done you can execute github actions mm. so if there are problems here let's say your commit message is not properly formatted right mm. then uh, you, uh, your github actions can catch that but what is the use it is like uh, taking action after the wrong commit has happened right, right. so it is uh, as you say say one of the things in code review is let's say you want to review whether people are following the coding guidelines mm so you can catch that here using github actions an automated script can automatically check all the commits all the changes and immediately warn uh, that files x y and z are not following coding guidelines on these particular points so this can be done but the whole point of git hooks is uh, you have heard of the term shift left so no. shift left is a, a term coming from the world of devops devops where mm -hmm. you try to do your testing and the validation as early as possible in the development cycle so in mm -hmm. in a sense you are shifting the operations to the left that means earlier in the process so what git hooks is doing is trying to actually shift left some of the aspects of code review earlier so instead of catching right. uh, styling problems here uh, you know after the push has happened 
you can catch them right here before the commit happens. Hmm. So uh, developers can proactively correct the problems before they even push the changes to the repo, remote repo. Yeah, makes sense. Right. right. But uh, like I said, if you have a limitation on running server side hooks, then yeah, you are stuck with this. GitHub actions, for example, or any kind of CICD pipeline. Sure, sure. How the version control will be notified and uh, permission level in the admin level where it will be maintained? Yeah, uh, I didn't fully understand your question. Uh, why? Uh, what do you mean like, version control is notified? Yeah. Like if enterprise level, if many people are writing uh, the code and are uploading, uh, like you know how it is going to be notified, which is the final control or something. You have any uh, particular that is part of Git also? system. That, okay. Git, uh, that is a core feature of Git. It's nothing to do with hooks. Okay. Yeah, the basic Git feature is to do uh, coordinate uh, multiple changes from multiple team members. Mm -hmm. So it has the facility when push can happen, when you should do a merge. And if the merge fails, there will be a merge conflict. So all that is uh, the core part of Git that is already handled. Yeah. OK, OK. Fine. OK, any other questions? So those of you interested, I will sh uh, show you the. Briefly, I will show you. Devopedia's own uh, implementation. Oops, OK. I have only one hook, it's uh, implemented. So I have here update secrets, update CSS, update JSON, uh, not JSON, update JavaScript. And then when the hook executes, I call this. So I get uh, some last commit time I get. And then I call these functions. And then there is a utility function. Separate file here which will execute system commands and then git commands. So last commit time, anybody can get it. You have to run this command. And then I, since this, since the last commit time, I get what are the files which have been modified. This is actually not the best way to do it, but uh, for our use case, this was sufficient. But there are actually better ways to do this. So this is what I do and uh, this is passed to these functions. So now these functions can check, for example, you know, if any of these files have changed, but I have not regenerated the concatenated and minified uh, file, then my Git hook can warn me. And this whole thing takes hardly, uh, I mean, it takes less than a second in the order of milliseconds to run. So this is a good use case. It will not impact developer productivity. So this is how it is. And uh, so like, for example, if. The condition is not met, for example, input files have changed, but output files have not changed. Then I print a warning to the user updated JS files not concatenated to this. So run execute gulp concat JS. And then I return with a non zero value. So this will about the commit process. Same thing for the other whenever there is an error, I will return a non-zero value and print an appropriate message to the developer. So this is how it works. So actually Git hooks is a very simple thing. Uh, it's uh, easy to learn and now that you have sat through this session, it should be possible for you to start implementing it uh, in your own projects. And hopefully, you know, it will help you catch things uh, earlier. Don't worry that uh, you are not able to use server side hooks. Uh, if your team members are all cooperative and they find, uh, I mean, they understand the value in using client side hooks. 
as a matter of policy, you can tell them they should always be using enable all the client side hooks and uh, you know uh, many of the things like what even uh, coding guidelines they can be caught in the pre commit hook. So what uh, Naveen mentioned, uh, even if you can't run server side hooks, you can uh, do many of the things in the client side hooks. OK, uh, any last questions? <laughs> or comments? One of the most useful hooks probably is like uh, AWS credentials or private keys. So those hooks can uh, protect you from uh, like by mistake committing those secrets into the repository. So those hooks can catch the those problems. So at the minimum you can uh, use those hooks. You don't have to implement them. You can use uh, I showed you the repository pre commit uh, repository so you can reuse the hooks from there. OK, then uh, thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.